Hello again. Today we're going to be talking about a different technique for integration called integration by partial fractions. So let's get started. Now sometimes when I'm finding the antiderivative of a fraction, the numerator is the derivative of the denominator, which means I can just use u substitution to figure out what the antiderivative is. We've gone through examples of that. But sometimes the numerator is not the derivative of the denominator. It's not even a multiple of the derivative of the denominator. It's just something entirely different. So we need a strategy to figure out the antiderivative of that expression. So what we want to do is we want to see if the denominator in the expression is factorable. Now in the example that I'm giving, uh, the denominator is factorable. x squared plus 4x plus 3 can be factored into x plus 3 times x plus 1. So I can continue with this. What I can do from there is I can separate the original fraction into two fractions and each one has one of the factors in it. So 5 over x plus 3 times x plus 1 is some constant a over x plus 3 plus a different constant b over x plus 1. And so my job now is just to figure out the values of a and b. So to do that, I'm going to get rid of all of the denominators in that equation. And I do that by multiplying by the original denominator um, in its factored form. So that's what I've done in the next line. And what you'll notice is uh, every factor in the numerator uh, that is in parentheses cancels with every factor in the denominator. So all I'm left with on the left-hand side is that 5. On the right-hand side, the factors of x plus 3 divide out. Um, and in the last fraction, the x plus 1 factors divide out. So now I have absolutely no denominators in my equation, making it much easier to solve. All right, so now I can find values of a and b. It looks like I've got three unknowns, a, b, and x. But actually what I've done is um, I'm not solving for x. I started with an equation that was true for all values of x, and I still have an equation that is true for all values of x. So I can just be smart and choose which values of x to plug into this equation in order to figure out the values of constant a and constant b. So I start by plugging in x equals negative 1. And notice how when I do that, the constant a is being multiplied by negative 1 plus 1, which is 0. That makes the a term completely go away. So now I'm just solving for constant b. So I get an equation that says 5 equals 2b, which means that b will equal 5 over 2. And so I go back to the original equation at the top, and I replace x with negative 3. Now what's going to happen is b is being multiplied by negative 3 plus 3, which is 0. So the b term goes away, and I am allowed to solve for that constant a. And so constant a is going to be equal to negative 5 halves. All right, so now I know what a and b are supposed to be equal to. So I can rewrite the original expression that I was supposed to be finding the antiderivative of as something that is equivalent to it. So finding the uh, antiderivative of one of those is the same thing as finding the antiderivative of the other because we've just shown that those two um, expressions are equal to each other. So I just rewrite it using the partial fractions. And because they're being added, I can separate it into two separate integrals. Well, how does that help me? Um, well, if I pull the constant multipliers out front, I have negative 5 halves times the antiderivative of 1 over x plus 3 plus positive 5 halves times the antiderivative of 1 over x plus 1. Well, I know the antiderivatives of both of those expressions. Uh, the antiderivative of 1 over x plus 3 is the natural log of the absolute value of x plus 3, and the antiderivative of 1 over x plus 1 is the natural log of the absolute value of x plus 1. So I multiply each of those by the constants out front. I, I remember to add the plus c, at the end, and that is my antiderivative. If I were to take the derivative of that, I would get back to the original expression that um, I started with. All right, now what happens if there are repeated factors? This doesn't show up too much, but I wanted to let you know how to handle that just in case it does. Um, if a factor in the denominator has a degree that's higher than one, you have to create fractions with all possible degrees of that factor. Um, so we're going to do an example. Notice how in the original example, we just had factors um, where the exponent of each factor was 1. 
but look at this denominator. I have two X minus one, which is fine, um, but the second factor, X minus three, is being raised to the three. So I have to separate this into fractions where two X minus one is the denominator of one of the fractions, but X minus three has to be represented with all possible exponents, uh, just because I don't know um, whether one of the fractions would have x minus 3 to the 1 or x minus 3 to the 2. Um, some of those may not even exist, in which case b, c, or d might equal 0. But I have to be ready for uh, every possible exponent of x minus 3. So that's why I write it there. Um, and so for each fraction, I put a new constant on the top. That's why you see a, b, c, and d there. Oh, so now I go through the same process and I um, multiply by the original denominator. Um, and so that looks pretty messy, but hopefully what's going to happen is every denominator is going to be canceled with part of the numerator. So on the left-hand side, um, that denominator gets canceled with everything that was in parentheses, so all I'm left with is the two. On the right-hand side, that first fraction is going to have the two x minus ones cancel, and then in the second fraction, the x minus 3 is going to cancel with one of the x minus 3s on top. So that exponent of 3 gets replaced with a 2. In the next fraction, uh, two of the x minus 3s uh, on the top cancel with the entire denominator. So I only have x minus 3 uh, to the 1 on top. And then in the last fraction, all of the x minus 3s cancel. So I just have that 2x minus 1 factor and the constant d, of course. Uh, the important thing is that all denominators have gone away. So now I have this equation here that has no denominators and I can solve uh, for A, B, C, and D. So again, I'm smart about which X's that I plug into this equation. So I start by uh, letting X equal three. And when that happens, the A term is gonna go away, the B term is gonna go away, and the C term is gonna go away because they all have X minus three as a factor. And when x equals 3, x minus 3 is going to equal 0. So that's going to be multiplied by everything else that's there. So I just have the term that has d in it. So I have 2 equals 5d. So uh, d is going to equal 2 fifths, which is 0.4. Okay, and now I plug in 1 half. Um, and when I do that, again, three of the terms are going to cancel out because when x is a half, 2x minus 1 is going to equal 0. So any uh, term that has 2x minus 1 as a factor is going to go away. So now all I have is that uh, a is going to equal negative 16 over 125, which works out to be negative 0.128. So I have a value for d and I have a value for a. What about b and c? I've already plugged in everything that can make one of the factors equal 0. So what am I supposed to do about b and c? Well, remember, I can uh, plug in anything that I want. So first of all, before I do that, I am going to replace A with negative 0.128, and I am going to replace D with 0.4, just so that I only have B and C to deal with. All right, so now what I can do is I can replace X with something that may not make uh, any of the terms equal zero. Uh, I really don't have any choice anymore. So I'm just picking a random value of x, x equals zero, and I plug that in. So none of the terms are gonna go away, um, and I'm gonna end up with an expression that will have b and c in it. So I will rewrite it so that uh, the b term and the c term are on one side and there's a constant on the other. So that's what I get when I plug in x equals zero. I'm going to plug in another value of x that I haven't used yet, which is x equals one, and I get that equation there. And just like before, I'm going to uh, simplify everything and then rewrite it so that the B term and the C term are on one side and there's a constant on the other. So those two green equations are what I'm dealing with right now. And so I go back to uh, systems of equations. Okay, I have two equations with two unknowns and I can figure out what those are. Use whatever method you want. Um, I'm assuming that you're familiar with solving systems of equations, so if you want to use a calculator to do that, you can. Um, but if you want to do it by hand, you can do that as well. Uh, but no matter what your process, you're going to end up that B has a value of 0.064, which is the same as eight over 125, and C is going to equal negative 0.16, which is the same as negative four over 25. 
And so I go back to the original question. That's what I started with. And so that's what I'm ending with. I've got four separate integrals, um, but I know the coefficient that's gonna go in front of each one. And so I have, um, I have a factor on in the denominator of each of those um, expressions that's within an integral. And so now I can continue because I know the antiderivative of each one. Um, I know that there's gonna be a natural logarithm for the first two, but then for the last two integrals, there's going to be um, a power rule that I have to follow for integration. So uh, what I end up with is uh, negative 16 over 125 times the natural logarithm of 2x minus 1 divided by 2. Remember, whenever you have that, you have to divide by any x coefficient uh, whenever you are integrating to get a natural log. Um, the second one is much easier. It's just 8 over 125 times the natural logarithm of the absolute value of x minus 3. And then the other two terms, as I said, follow the power rule where I add one to the exponents and I divide by the new exponent. So that's how I get those last two terms. And then I simplify as necessary um, just to get nicer looking fractions. And so that is actually the answer to that original problem. So believe it or not, if you took the derivative of this whole thing, you would get back to two over two X minus one times X minus three to the third. Um, so that is how you use integration by partial fractions. If you have any questions, please let me know and I will see you tomorrow.